This is Bob Academy. Today we continue our study in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 6, verse 1. We'll finish up our preliminary and get into the chapter today. Well, before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins at the same time we're allowing the Spirit to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege and the freedom, all that you provided so we can study your word. We do ask that our hearts and our minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. When I pray that our hearts and minds be open, that's really important. We need to make sure that we are tuned in to God when we study the Word of God. Now, Revelation is a difficult book. And one of the things that makes it difficult is that, well, if you've studied it very long or some seriousness put into your study, you know that there are a number of differences of opinions on many passages. Uh, even differences in the introduction and history and background and things like that and how you're going to interpret the Scripture. And many of these men are scholars and well-known and very even senior to me. Uh, many have passed away. Uh, some of my favorite scholars have passed away in the last 10 or 20 years. Ones that I, some I studied under, some I relied on in their works. But for you and me, we need to make sure that we go to God and give ourselves over to him and ask for his insight and his understanding. Because when you come to these conflicts with, well, maybe it's your favorite teachers or your the best teachers you know of, and you see conflicts, there's only two way there's only two things you can do about this. Make sure you're trusting in his spirit and your guidance. And at the same time, you're looking at the scripture. Don't let someone who you like as a teacher or maybe he's a, uh, a pastor somewhere or a professor somewhere or you've liked his write, writings and you trust him more. Whatever you do, make sure you compare and look seriously into the scripture. Let it be the determining and final factor. Even if you consider yourself handicapped because you don't know the languages, well, you can do a lot by looking in the English but again, of course, the languages do help. But many mistakes that I've found in interpreting the scripture uh, have little to do with the languages. There's good translations, and you can weigh the different translations. But my point is, make sure you give yourself over to the Lord on this, and make sure the scripture makes your final decisions. Now, in our last lesson, we were looking at text that showed us that what we're about to study in chapter 6 and the opening seals is also the beginning of the seven-year tribulation period, also called Daniel's 70th week. We looked at Daniel, especially 9, 24 through 27, and made connections with the Olivet Discourse of Jesus recorded in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. Now, even after all of that, <clears throat> after all of that, the evidence for this being the beginning of the tribulation is not overwhelming. But as you get further into the book, I think you will see it has to be starting with the beginning of the seals. We do know what's in the future. We know what hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Leaving us one option, it's still in the future and it's prophetic. So for right now, we'll leave it at that. Now there's a lot we need to do with Matthew 24. That is probably one of the more misunderstood books. Um, and I know that I've studied over the years and I've, I've tried to figure out what it means with certain passages and certain phrases. And I pretty much came to my final understanding of this in our uh, series on God's plan of the ages. Uh, now we're talking about Matthew 24 because I have not studied Matthew verse by verse though I've done Luke and John. And Matthew may be one of my next books, uh, maybe the next few years. 
There's a lot of valuable information there, of course, as many other books do. But we're going to get into Matthew 24 probably before we get completely out of the seals because there's some important interpretation points there we need to see. Well, let's look at our outline again. I, I must say that these outlines, uh, they're helpful, but sometimes they get you in a little bit of trouble because it just depends on interpretations. You can't always uh, know how you're going to fill out an outline until you do the whole book. And I haven't done the whole book yet. I'm just ahead a few chapters, but I also realize that I need to give you something to see where we're going. So if I make some adjustments later on, um, I'll point that out. Now, one of the things I want to show you, uh, this is actually number three. Notice how I call this the second vision. Well, depending on how you want to interpret it, but there are several visions or he might say he has a vision, he changes locations, there's another vision, and that can get confusing, and that's not really that crucial to know. So uh, you might even say during a vision he has another uh, set of uh, things to see. So be flexible on that, and I'm not going to be uh, too fixed on the outline, but basically I want you to see the outline to see where we're going and locate stuff. That's the value of an outline. And I'll try to put it at the end of the series or towards the beginning somehow. But um, the outline is very helpful. And then you can look at other works that have outlines. Many of your commentaries have outlines. Your, your study Bibles have outlines at the beginning. You can use them as well. But this gives us, gives us an idea where we're going. Well, we are in, as you can see, Roman numeral 3, number C, or letter C, I should say. And number one, the first six seals. Well, we're at the point where the Lamb is going to open the seals of the scroll. Now, keep in mind, the seals themselves are not the scroll. And that can be uh, an assumption people make. Because it talks about him breaking a seal, then it describes what's going to happen. Well, what's he reading? Is he reading the scroll? Or just this picture and part of the vision. Well, well, we'll work through that as we continue. But that's a question I think some people never think about. What's he actually reading here? Or is he reading here anything? So let's just take it for what it says. The first seal, the conqueror on a white horse. Verse 1. Now I watched when the lamb opened one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying, like a voice of thunder, come. Well, let's break this down into phrases. Now I watched when the lamb opened one of the seven seals. In the previous chapter, we saw the lamb take the scroll out of the right hand of the one on the throne. At that point, the creatures and the elders fell down and began to sing the new song. Now the lamb starts to break open the seals. He opens the first seal and John writes, and I heard one of the four living creatures. One of the four near the throne. Remember each creature represented a category of the earthly creatures. Saying, as it go on, goes on, like a voice of thunder, come. Thunder is symbolic of power, authority, and coming judgment. Coming from the throne. So the Lamb opened the seal, then the living creature speaks with this thunderous voice of authority. Command is relayed from the throne. Come. Question, who is to come? Now, there is a textual issue where some text add some form of uh, the words come and see, or uh, they add it to the come. This is best taken as a gloss. Now, what's a gloss? Well, you'll see that in commentaries sometimes. It's basically an interpretive addition to the text. So if you look at the better text, also the shorter readings, if you know anything about textual criticism, you usually go with a shorter reading because copyists were less likely to add 
so they're sure and 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 not leave uh, things out so if you have the shorter reading would be just come and that makes the most sense best text most interpretive sense now first of all some say that he's talking to john well john's already there if he is being addressed as we'll see just a few verses we would see something like look or hear or behold but he's the one not being addressed in other words he's not the one being called to come he's already there observing observing listening in the throne room he's watching the lamb break the seals the command come is towards what we see show up a horse came forth with the rider we will see the command given three more times each time a horse comes forth with a rider i mean if it was john how many times can he come forward all right so the point we see is that these horses start to come in and listen to the language used verse 2 reveals the first horse and rider and i looked and behold came there's what came a white horse and the one who rode upon it had a bow and a crown was given to him, and he rode out as a conqueror in order, and that he might conquer. This last phrase sounds awkward. It is awkward in English, but uh, there's a reason for that in the Greek, and I leave it that way. It gives you an opportunity to explain it and see that this is emphasized in a certain way. So let's break this down. And I looked, and behold, so John was watching to see what comes in response to the command to come, and there came a white horse. Now, we've learned that white often symbolizes purity when it came to garments, but this is a horse. Horses in those days, of course, were a premium animal to have in the ancient world, uh, even just to ride them. You'd hear about a donkey now and then, but this is a horse. So this is sort of like the, I don't know what the biggest car is that you would think of, but uh, in the United States years ago, it's probably a Cadillac, to be realistic. They were the big, nicest cars, but now we have this really nice white horse because horses, white, are a little rare. Sometimes they're stallions. And they were ridden by commanders in the military, and they symbolized victory, or maybe even a king might ride a horse, an emperor of some sort. And that's the idea behind this. They were powerful. Horses were powerful animals, and often in battle considered frightening. You've seen some of those movies uh, where they used horses as sort of you know, the vehicle to go forward, and they're, they have some of them have some sort of breastplate on them to protect them from uh, swords or something else. Anyway, they were powerful and often considered frightening when coming up against them in battle, if you had to do that. Now, remember the rider controls the horse. That's obvious, but people need to remember that. It's not just about the horse here. It's about the rider. So the rider's responding to the command with this horse coming forward. He's a conquering horse and rider. They come before John. So that's the symbolism we need to see here. It's a conquer. We see that later in the verse as well. He also has a weapon. And the one who rode it, uh, rode it upon it had a bow. I had an extra word in there. I just took it out. It's, and the one who rode up on it had a bow. That reflects the Greek. Now, a bow, we're familiar with those, are weapons of war. They were used similar to light-filled artillery that we have today. Maybe something like a mortar as well. But they were often shot over the troops that were going forward uh, or right before your troops assaulted. They would stop firing their arrows. But this rider has the bow. So he has a bow in his hand, and he's riding a horse. Arrows would be released shortly before and during the main assault. So what we have here is a bowman on a horse. Now, in those days, the Parthians were well known for not only being a cavalry, but using bows while riding. They were very effective and known for military tactic of appearing to be 
turning and riding away, but then they would turn in their uh, saddles, whatever they had as saddles, and they'd turn and fire arrows. So they looked like they're retreating, then suddenly they turn around and they start firing at you while they're going away. So it was a very fact effective uh, cavalry uh, tactic. So this is what the ancient would, ancients in these days would think of as those Parthians. Now the Parthians were those Persian type people on the uh, east side of the Roman border. The Romans did never, never did well with them very long. I think they beat them in some major battles, but they never conquered them and took their land. That's about as far as the Romans got. So they would be in, be in mind. They're still a force to be reckoned with. And a crown was given to him, to this writer. Now, we've studied the crown in many ways. This is the crown representing authority and power, dominion, and victory. In this case, it would be more centered on victory. He has the power, he has authority, but he also has victory, which fits the next line, the one that's a little confusing. He rode out as a conqueror in order that he might conquer. The first rider is dressed for the part, one might say. He received a crown showing that he's a conqueror, though he has not conquered anything yet. When he does, he will be swift and effective. Now, we'll talk about the timing of these later on, but let's just understand in the vision he rides out, and he's conquering, and he's swift, and he's a victor. Uh, Again, the phrase, and that he might conquer. That's his whole purpose, subjunctive mood. That's the probability. He's out to conquer. Let's put it that way. That'd probably be a good way to put it in, in just smooth English. He rode out conquering, and he's out to conquer. That's his objective. He's ready to go. A name is not given to this person, but what he has and does. And that's important because it's not a person. Now, that might surprise some of you because many say this is the Antichrist. Well, we'll look into it. Let me give you some major views on who or what this horse and rider are. Understand right now the horse and rider go together in this concept of what they are. Now, some have taken this to be Christ by referring to the scene in chapter 19. But there are many reasons it's not Christ. At this point, Christ is standing there as the lamb opening the seals. The crowns and weapons are different. The scene itself is much different. So the scene is really different. That begins in 1911, if you want to go check it out. Now, some say it's basically the opposite. Some say this writer is Satan, that he's conquering the nations at some point. And this makes good sense, except one major objection. And this is an important one. This is why it's not Satan. If that's the case, then who are the other writers? We have three more writers coming up, and they don't fit any individual. Basically, these are all descriptions of judgments, including the first one. Uh, you might say conditions for judgments, or the environments of the environment of judgment, the environment. We'll see that the next one has to do with taking peace from the earth. Then one after that is famine. And then the fourth one is death. So these are all events. So if we're going to stay consistent interpretation, we must see this first horse and rider as a time of military conquest. And leave it at that. The conditions in which there's aggressive wars and battles are going on. Now, it doesn't mean that Satan can't be working at that period. Not at all. Nations and people are conquering other people. Alliances are being formed. There's a major shift in the conquering and occupation of lands and people. In other words, we're coming down to where we're getting sides all fit. Alliances are being made. Uh, nations are forming. Armies are taking sides. Whatever has to go on. If you're a student of World War I or World War II, you know this went on. Uh, things really changed after World War I. What happened to the Ottoman Empire is gone. Uh, changes in the Middle East, changes in Europe. Uh, uh, the uh, 
what happened to Germany, what became of Germany, that shifted around. Same is true in World War II, where you gave much of, where the, I should say, put it this way, much was given over to the uh, uh, Soviet uh, Empire. On the other hand, we know from other scriptures that the Antichrist will lead one or more of these conquering armies in the early days of the tribulation. So we, we got to stay flexible here. And he will pretend to be the Christ, and he will be very, very successful. So uh, it fits well that uh, he's pretending to be Christ. There's the white horse. But at the same time, he's uh, is conquering rapidly nations. So that this view as Satan imitating Christ is one of, is is in one sense correct. But this verse is not specifically describing him, but providing the conditions of war for that to happen. This imitation with his conquering will be viewed by many as good. Don't miss this, as good, when in fact, this will involve the Antichrist and his conquest to align the nations for his greater control and world dominion. Let me repeat that. Let me put it this way. Satan will be very much active at the beginning of the tribulation, conquering and getting his alliances lined up to continue his conquest. And we've studied a lot of this in Daniel and other books. He'll align the nations for his greater control and eventual eventual world dominion. Now, one of the first things that Jesus warned of when he gave his Olivet Discourse was deception. Now, we're going to talk about the Olivet Discourse at length later on. But let's just, let me put it this way, let's be rather flexible about that. Because, and I'll just go ahead and give you a preview, the signs where it says wars and rumors of wars and and, uh, famines and earthquakes and so on, these disasters. Uh, This doesn't line up perfectly with the seals as many have taught that and are convinced that they're basically the same thing. They are not, and I'll show you why later. But you can just do a uh, quick uh, comparison and you'll see some pretty significant differences you don't see thing, anything about a, a white horse or rider in the first seal. All I'm saying is deception is very big at the beginning of the tribulation. The best word to use for that today is propaganda. The Olivet Discourse talks about the end of the age. Some of it does. Uh, It's in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Much of the world be backing the Antichrist, fooled into thinking, who are fooled into thinking he's the Christ. He is powerfully backed by Satan, while other armies of the world are forming their alliances and conquering elsewhere. Let's talk about this deception, because, folks, there's one of the biggest enemies today of truth is deception. But the word that we need to use is probably uh, best fits. Best fits deception is propaganda. Propaganda manipulates people. Evil leaders learned to use it centuries ago, and we have seen it used many times in uh, uh, the last century. Uh, World War One, World War Two. In the United States, it's very big today. Uh, A number of ways it comes to uh, the media. Very difficult to get the straight truth in basic, uh, what they call mainstream media, the main networks. You have to go to outside networks to go to the internet to get the truth now because it's so bad. And they've learned to use it. Those who oppose Christianity, those who oppose conservative principles, that is morality, justice, fairness, um, 
what we mean by uh, real uh, treating people equally, those things are distorted. We don't get the news we need to hear. And often it's left out. It's kind of like going to school nowadays. They don't teach you what you need to learn. and They teach you stuff you don't need to know. That's one reason I do not encourage my kids to go to college anymore. Uh, the ones they would go to are probably way too expensive anyway, and there's no sense going in debt to a, get schooling that you really are not going to help you. Now, I'm not trying to run anybody's lives here. I'm just saying this is what we've learned. The propaganda is so strong when they come home and report to me what their teachers are telling them and what the students are saying and what they're ca calling them or telling them to do and objecting to uh, anything Christian. Uh, it's no place for a Christian to be because what you're going to learn, you're going to learn two or three years uh, of nonsense and maybe something that will apply to your degree or that will help you, but uh, I don't think it's worth the price. But that's your, that's your decision, of course. But I'm trying to point out that the propaganda day is so strong and it's typical. It's going to be very strong during the uh, tribulation period. So you can see the foreshadowing already going on. I now now look at BBC and think, well, maybe they're different. No, they pick up on the same propaganda that uh, our mainstream media is pumping out. And I know it's wrong because I've heard these people speak and they turn around and distort what they say or say they say things they don't say. And it, it, it's constant. It's constant. So they propagate these falsehoods continuously, and we'll see that even more so. How do you think people fall for the Antichrist and believe he's the Christ? Well, there's a couple of things we can see already in society that points that out. I mean, that should puzzle people. How can people believe the Antichrist is the Christ? Well, because they have been trained to think that good is evil and evil is good. So those who are actually good and justice and righteous, now listen to this, who believe in a man and woman marriage, that family is, uh, you know, a, a, a wife and husband and children, rather than distorted in the perversion they have today, they're considered enemies. They're considered evil. They're not treating people, people equally. Uh, well, we want to to stay our lives living in truth and the way God has set it up for the human race. We've studied this in God's plan of the ages in detail. We went back to the beginning of the family, beginning of marriage, beginning of nations. Now, all these entities are part of God's plan to keep the human race alive. So we outlaw murder. We're against lying and stealing. Believe people should have property, be able to protect their property. These are things that are taught in Scripture, but they're also moral principles for the human race. What would life be, out, be like if you couldn't have property? Well, that's not yours. That's ours. Whoever wants it. Wait a minute. I bought that. Yeah, but it's ours. It's everyone. You just see how this propaganda is getting stronger and stronger today. So understand this. There's going to be a lot of propaganda at the beginning. Let's talk about some beginning tribulational events. Some we've already looked at. Now we see another. I'm going to put them in a little summation here. Two we just looked at. Two we talked about in our previous lesson. Beginning tribulation events, number one, the seven-year treaty with Israel. Two, the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Three, the rapid conquering by military forces, particularly one who will in time claim to be Christ, but is the Antichrist. A period of great deception and propaganda. And folks, I cannot uh, exaggerate how powerful this deception and propaganda will be. People are already be thinking in these terms when it happens, as many are today. Uh, so I could go on and on about this, but 
there are people who are intentionally trying to foul up the system here in the United States. So we'll say and admit, finally, it's no good. Let's abandon it. Let's don't use it anymore. You know, it's like trying to play a game with a friend and the friend keeps cheating. If he's not going to follow the rules, then what kind of game is that? So you have to have morality. You have to have fairness. You have to have uh, rules that people are going to follow. Now, from the Apostle Paul, we know that something or someone right now is holding Satan and his forces back from moving forward with their evil in a major way. So we've talked about some of the events that happen at the beginning of the tribulation, but we also know they're not happening fully yet. I want us to go back and look at what Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians 2, 6, and 7 to remind you of something. 2 Thessalonians 2, 6, And now you know what holds him back so that he will be revealed in his own time. He is referring to what we see in verse 7, For the hidden power, that is the mystery of lawlessness, is already at work. Only he who restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So, he is the man of lawlessness. He's being held back. This would be the Antichrist. He's backed by Satan's power. He's Satan's man. Now, he actually has two men. He has the false prophet, too, but we don't see much of him until later in Revelation. Now, there is a couple of different views on what this is. That's the restrainer. Now, we know from Scripture that good government is a restrainer of evil by punishing evil. That's one of the restraints of evil, Romans 13, 3 through 5. As along with other divine institutions, they hold back evil. They hold back wrongdoing. One of those divine institutions is marriage. Another one's family. Once you start redefining marriage and family and say it's not between a man and a woman or a family, it's just all of us together. We're all happy here, so this is our family. Now, you can call your team your family. I don't care, but what I'm saying is when it comes to a family, family, it's a man and wife, a husband and wife, and their children. Good government, societal boundaries restrain lawlessness. But in this context, Paul is writing of the man of lawlessness. Now, don't miss that term lawlessness. What does that mean? He has no laws he abides by, except his own. Lawlessness. We have laws for a reason, and we can change those laws. And we, in the United States, we have a voting system that can change the laws, and we also even vote for people who enforce the laws, make judgments in courts, and that's important that we get good people in there who recognize law, or we're going to have lawlessness. That's one of the problems we're having right now in the United States. The judicial system is becoming corrupted. The policing, the policing system is becoming corrupted. And law and order are cavalierly broken. Laws broken. Border crossings are a good example. We have a federal government, and I'm not just doing this for political cause. I'm just pointing out a good illustration of lawlessness. If we are supposed to have borders as a nation, and we learned this, we know we're supposed to have, otherwise you're not a nation. You don't have citizenship if you don't have borders and restrictions on who can be a citizen. Then you don't have citizenship, and then basically you don't have a nation. The United States is, has been, in the last couple of years especially, on the verge of losing, losing what one defines as a citizen. In fact, some people believe you don't have to have any kind of identification to vote. Well, that's nonsense. Only citizens could vote. That's one reason we have a nation. And that's one reason that we've been able to be prosperous because we've learned what a nation is and stick to the rules. But when you start breaking the rules, you break down the nation and pretty soon your society 
becomes just whatever the lawlessness produces. This is Satan's man. Now, I don't believe that the Antichrist is going to be a moral, upstanding person. But people say, well, yeah, but he's supposed to be like Christ. I think people's definition of what Christ is will, well, compared to the Bible, will change if it hasn't already. Many believe that they have a God who just says, well, you just anybody can be married, right? And this goes back to the propaganda. So be very careful not to be caught up in some of this propaganda. We saw it very strong with the whole COVID thing still going on. People are forced to take on masks that hardly help or, or don't help at all. They're forced to take shots that, if anything, they probably do more damage than they do good. And there's other stuff going on as well. Uh, the whole green uh, movement the climate change, electric cars. Folks, that's not going to work. And I'm not going to get into the detail here, but that's not going to, where are they going to get a lithium for all the batteries? You know, I just, I hear this stuff and I say, that's just nonsense. They're going to ruin the entire transportation system. So you have enough battery juice to travel 100 miles. You ever going to see your grandparents anymore or travel state to state or travel the country? You won't be able to. But, I just want to show you that this is what we mean by propaganda and they don't follow the rules and now we start to have lawlessness and this becomes the new foundation for what people would say, this is our country. Now what happens is this man of lawlessness, under this first seal, he will advance his armies. He'll advance his armies and he will seize territories, power and control. As the propaganda machine grows, he will convince people he's the man, he's the one. And people will gladly fall for it. And if there's any day and time in which we can see that live going on right now, it's today. How can you possibly vote for someone who can hardly talk? Or vote for someone who's so old and so demented that they can't keep a couple of sentences together because they believe they've been propagandized to think this is better than anything else. So when you think about how can people view this Antichrist as a Christ, the pattern will be similar to what we have today. But when the restrainer is removed along with good government, the vast majority of people will believe that good is evil and evil is good. They will not have the perception to see what he's really up to or watch their real plan. Those who stand for good will be the enemy, including Christians. That's why they want to shut Christianity down shut down morality. Now understand, when I talk about morality, I'm talking about basically uh, things like the Ten Commandments, except for the Sabbath. That's an Old Testament thing, but do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not lie on the witness stand, right? These are basically principles of morality. That is the fundamental core of conservatism as well. Now, don't misunderstand. Some people call themselves conservatives and they're homosexuals. No, you can't be that. You've got a problem there because that, against, that goes against one of the fundamental principles of morality is homosexuality. So don't fall for that. Now, those who still have clear thinking will not fall for all the propaganda of false alarms, greater government control, people choosing their own gender, acceptability of all kinds of perversions and sinful activity, justifying murder and destruction of property for their cause. Folks, that's immoral. And we know it's also sinful. But the human race has to have moral laws or they would just take whatever they want and kill whoever they want. No, that's why God gave us as human beings 
instilled in us from birth certain principles of right and wrong. And if parents are good, they'll develop those within the young children. Then if one decides he wants to live his own life and forget all the laws, well, he grows up to be a little criminal, and then a big criminal. Like so many do today, they will form in their minds what God and Christ are, and Satan will play the role to appeal to evil people who think they're doing good when in fact they are doing evil. Now let me just pause for a minute and remind you what I'm doing. I'm developing the idea of propaganda, the deception. Then we get to Jesus' teaching on the end times. He talks about deception. That's one of the first things he talks about. Don't let people deceive you. False Christ, people who claim this or that, misleading. Think of the large group of people whose thinking is so warped. And you take them and give them a leader who has a powerful military. And they'll be glad to shut down everybody who doesn't agree with them using force. That's one reason they want to take guns away from citizens so they can't protect themselves from this evil force. There's another thing that will happen in the tribulation. The tribulation and probably at the beginning, Satan will be allowed to let his antichrist come forward and begin his onslaught on the human race with lawlessness. So lawlessness will be accepted. The institutions that we once respected will now be lawless and unfair and unjust. And if they don't like what you're doing, they'll get rid of you, get you out of the way, especially if you have any kind of power. So what I'm saying is much of what we see today is a preview of the evil that will greatly increase and include, listen to this, much more force. What is so disturbing and is probably as deadly of all this is the propaganda that comes with it. Evil disguised as good and they will call good evil through deception of doing good that's what they'll call it like getting rid of those pesky christians or shutting down their voice their ministries their witnessing like when they speak of the real christ and expose the antichrist to the public and so on what seems best people begin to follow some of you know who've kept up with this ministry that we've had a difficult time being able to support the ministry because of the regulations they keep putting upon uh, ministries like this. You have to, if you're going to be a church, you have to be this kind of church. You're going to shut down what we tell you. You're going to follow this set of rules. You're going to make sure everything's filtered through us so we can say you're okay to exist. No. That's not what the church is. The church serves Jesus Christ. We don't serve the government. We go out and we give the gospel no matter what the government says. We continue to worship. We can continue together for worship, listen to videos, study the word, pray in public if we want, resist evil when it comes at us. We are to do God's will no matter how bad things get. We always do what God commands us to do, and we do not do things government tells us if it is forbidden in Scripture. The government tells you to lie or cheat. You don't do it. You don't do it. They tell you to do something immoral. You don't do it, period. So through the deception of doing good, like I said, getting rid of the Christians and so on, people will begin to accept the viewpoint of someone like the Antichrist. And he'll come to this front. People say, boy, that's our, that's our Savior right there. Don't forget this passage, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. It starts out like this, and no wonder, for Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. The most 
effective weapon of Satan is appearing to be beautiful. Appearing to be beautiful. To be right. To be righteous. Make people feel good about themselves. One of Graydon's one of Satan's greatest weapons is appearing to be good. So this release of evil and deception upon the world will continue to conquer until it completely comes under the Antichrist and its worldwide dominance. That will begin at the tribulation. It reaches its peak, its peak about the middle of the tribulation. We'll get to that soon. Evil deception comes from conquering the world, pulling it into the grips of Satan under the beast. Now, let me just spend a moment here on uh, one of the teachings about these horses that I just want to get out of the way because you might find this now and then. Zechariah 1.8 refers to a vision of Zechariah where there are four horses. Now, we've studied that in Zechariah. If you've been with me, the angel of the Lord is on a red horse as a spokesman and three other horses, red, sorrel, and white, with angelic riders. Notice, angelic riders. Not the case here. The three horsemen patrol the earth, reporting all the earth is at rest and uh, peace. Uh, that's 111. Actually, the word is quiet there. That's in Zechariah 111. Though they are colored horses, similar to those in Revelation 6, the riders in Zechariah are angels with a different purpose. The vision of Zechariah teaches that the Lord controls history, the rising and fall of nations, of peoples, and the protection of his people, Israel, among all this. Now, the concept they do have in common with these horses in Revelation 6 is that they can judge. And what we see here in Revelation 6 is judgment. The angels on horses in Zechariah 1.8 pertain to God's control of history, which includes judgment, and that is the thing they have in common. But the horses in Revelation 6 embody different kinds of judgment. Now, over in Zechariah 6, we do have a connection in Revelation, but it has to do with the four winds, and we don't see that until Revelation 7. And we'll see that in detail. Now, when we examine Christ's answer regarding his return and the Olivet Discourse in the Synoptic Gospels, let me just review for you what that says. He gives a general description of what is coming next. I give you the parallels here. There's deception, Matthew 24, 4, and 5. There's wars, Matthew 6 and 7. You can see the parallels. Earthquakes, plagues, and famines. Now, we have some interesting things to learn when we get to Matthew 24. Uh, fascinating things. I can hardly wait. <laughs> well, in these gospel passages, all three of these coming events that Christ mentions are foreshadowing what will come in the actual tribulation period. It's, it might, might say it's a, it's a preview of what's coming. The first four seals open the first waves of of war, famines, terrestrial, and cosmic disasters. It's important to understand that these are called birth pains in Matthew 24, 8 and Mark 13, 8. That's those very passages. They foreshadow or uh, preview, some uh, call them a prelude, okay, the end times and the release through the release of these riders. Until the seals are broken, there is general activity of deception, wars, earthquakes, famines, and plagues and deaths. So what I'm saying is, I'll just give you a preview of a preview. <laughs> the first teachings that Jesus talks about, as I just showed you, the deceptions and wars and earthquakes, plagues and famines, 
earthquakes, plagues, and famines, these are typical of judgment, or I should say judgments in the Old Testament. If a nation is going to be judged, they'll experience these things. It's made very clear with Israel. They'll go through all sorts of plagues and famines and wars and so on. So this is typical. And we'll get it a little more refined as we get to the passage in Matthew 24. But let's understand here that all the horsemen and the judgments come from God. Christ is to open the seals. The four living creatures issue the orders to the horsemen. The horsemen bring forth the event. Everything is under God's control and timing. All believers must understand this. When the judgments and persecution comes forth, as God's people, we must never forget that God with his Son, the angelic hierarchy, and the restraining Holy, Spirit, Holy Spirit's withdrawal allows evil activity to come. So what I'm saying is, the Trinity, God's servant angels, uh, the Trinity including the Holy Spirit's withdrawal, it all is going to allow this evil activity to come. Now here's where I think Christians misunderstand. Just because there's evil, it doesn't mean you don't stop doing good and doing right and resisting it when it comes at you, right? What are you gonna do when they come for your children? Or they come for your property. You're going to go to court with it? You say, oh, just go ahead. Evil has its way. No. You take legitimate means to stop it. Now, I can't tell you what that is until uh, it happens to you and you decide what is the right thing to do here. But you keep doing the right thing no matter how evil things get. You keep being moral. You keep being obedient. Right? And above all, you keep following Christ. As the seals are broken, the evil comes in waves in the form of judgments. Satan, his evil angels, will work through possession, demonic influence on the human race. Particularly unbelievers will see this show up in propaganda and deception, evil conquering, uh, unjust wars, uh, probably massive uh, imprisonment. Much of this is also self-destruction by the human race. So what we see here is the human race destroying itself. That's part of it. Men bringing punishment on themselves for their own sin. This is what depravity does. When, when things go lawless, I mean, it's the crook with the most power, the one with the most guns, uh, the one whose propaganda is most successful. And they destroy each other. The point being that much of this is mankind himself bringing this on himself. Once the boundaries are loosed, Satan and his forces are there to manipulate things his way. Satan wants the human race destroyed, especially Christians. Believers in their ignorant and sinful ways get in the way of Satan's way. Now, let me mention this because we can't leave this out because this will be a large group among those who will side with Satan and will come under judgment. And that is actually Christians who have decided to live a disobedient life. You say, well, how can Christians be that disobedient? Did you study the church letters? Some Christians are determined to live in disobedience, stay immature, unprepared. They get caught up in idol worship and apostasy and follow false teachers. Remember, five of those seven churches were not doing well because of basic disobedience. They're not growing. They're not prepared. When the pressure comes, they fall apart. Or they go to the other side because it's easier. There's not as much pain. It's safer. That's what's best for my family. They justify their wrongdoing. If there is not repentance and turning around in their life, they may suffer divine discipline, which will come along with this judgment. 
I mean, there's nothing like falling apart when the world's falling apart. Satan is permitted to run his course with his own strategy, but ultimately there is, now don't miss this, there is Trinitarian control of these events, as well as shepherding over the saints. We'll see that in chapter 7. God's still in control. Believers actually, by living faithful lives, defeat Satan's ways. So, just to anticipate, initially there is deception causing the events to follow to appear to be something they are not. However, the wars, the famine, that is, things like food shortages, deadly pestilence, pandemics, are the result, and massive deaths occur. Well, there's more to say on this, and this is where we'll continue next time. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for your word and the challenge you've given us today. Help us thoroughly understand, accurately understand what your word is saying so we can make the proper application and glorify you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.